Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, I'm Kathleen. I'm the founder of the Autism Glass Project at Stanford, and uh, I'll sort of tell you plenty about that and my project for the prize. Um, but today I was asked to come here and uh, talk to a group of high school students, you guys, about uh, what my path to invention looked like. Um, and so I'll start by telling you a story. Uh, and so this is the story of how I got convicted of federal tax fraud in Germany when I was 16 years old. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, what we call our Führungszeugnis. This is basically our criminal record in Germany, and this is mine. And down here it has an entry that says Steuerhinterziehung, which essentially means federal tax fraud. Uh, and so you might well ask how on earth a 16-year-old German guy can get convicted for a crime that by definition only adults can commit. Um, and so it, it turns out I was kind of a freaky kid by the time I was 16. I spent a lot of my upbringing like this. Um, and uh, by the time I was 15, uh, one of the things I'd been working on was uh, building iPhone apps. Uh, I'd launched about five apps on the App Store um, and sort of taught myself using my dad's old laptop as a Hackintosh, saved up my money, got my first iPod Touch for Christmas, um, and, uh, and, and realized that there were a lot of people out there who wanted to learn more about this, produced a podcast um, that became fairly popular. Uh, people started writing me emails, got a couple hundred emails a day from people looking to do something together. Um, and I realized that the place where a lot of this change that I was looking at, this change in, in computing that I was working on, uh, was coming from was the place where people first built the iPhone. It was Silicon Valley. Um, and so that's where I wanted to go. Um, but you have to realize that at the time, I, uh, I, really, I really never imagined shaking hands with anybody in this room. Right, or anybody who just had like MIT on their resume. That was completely out of my horizon. Um, but uh, by some miracle, I got introduced to this one guy named Steve Capps, uh, who now is like my father in Silicon Valley. Uh, but uh, Steve uh, was one of the um, uh, original members of the Macintosh team at Apple. He worked for Steve Jobs, and he was a huge idol to me. He, had, you know, he basically invented the patents that led up to the original iPhone. Um, but uh, at the time, he was working on a new company called Pay Near Me. They were based in Mountain View, and they were building a cash payments platform. And it so happened that Steve needed an iPhone developer. Um, and so I sent him my stuff. I sent him my podcast. He looked at my work. Um, and he said, sure, why don't we give this kid a chance and uh, bring him out to Silicon Valley for a little while. Um, and so together with a school project that made this possible, um, I got on a plane, and uh, two weeks later, I ended up, I came to Silicon Valley um, and wound up riding my bike to work every day, um, building, building apps. And it was a blast. Um, so I spent about four weeks to build out the first prototype of an app uh, that our CEO pitched to our investors and key partners. And Pinyami really liked the work, um, and I really enjoyed being there. And so they wanted to keep me around. Um, there's one problem, which is that for, immigration reasons we won't go into. Um, they couldn't pay me the first summer. Um, and so the idea was they'd, they'd give me a work laptop, I'll take back to Germany, and then I'll start working from Germany, um, and I could get paid that way, right? Wrong. Uh, it turns out to get paid from Germany, you need to go start a consulting business to work with a company, and to do that, you have to be 18 years old. Um, now, there's this great thing, though, uh, which is you can fight a six-month case with the German family court. Uh, where you basically argue why uh, they should essentially let you be an adult already. Um, and, and, and if they let you, uh, it, what happens is they send you this yellow letter in the mail, uh, and it basically says that as far as the law is concerned, you're now 18. Uh, and uh, that's what happened, and uh, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, I got my letter in the mail, and like, Jesus, I'm, I'm 18 years old, I can do anything now. Uh, I can practically drink, right? Wrong. Uh, so I started traveling a bit uh, and, and came to Silicon Valley quite frequently. And uh, I distinctly remember coming back uh, from, from my second summer there. I was 16 years old and got out of the plane in, uh, in Frankfurt. And there was this big red wall that says, uh, if you have anything to declare, uh, please use the red telephone below to contact the tax authorities. Otherwise, take the green exit. And you know, as just the usual, you go through the green exit, right? Wrong. Uh, it turned out I did have something to declare that I didn't know about. Uh, it was my work laptop that they had given me a year earlier. Um, 
And not only did I not know that you could be charged taxes for that up to 10 years later, but I also didn't know that it was a felony not to pay those taxes. But, you know, I thought that it was, you know, what, what are they going to do, right? Like, I, was, I, I pay my $500 right there at the airport, and, uh, you know, as, they, they can't trial me. I'm a minor, right? Wrong. <laughs> as far as the law was concerned, I was an adult at that point. And so they could trial me as an adult, and so they did. And they sentenced me to hours of social service at a nursery home. <laughs> so what, what's, what's the lesson here? <laughs> so, so here's the Calvin and Hobbes realization, which is that life's a lot more fun when you aren't responsible for your actions. Uh, and that's kind of a fun way of saying that when you're a kid uh, and, uh, and you, know, you, you sort of have this fail-safe harbor, that right now is school, that is possibly going to be college eventually. Um, and that's extremely valuable to have. No matter what happens, no matter what comes falling down in you, you're still going to be there, and everything's going to be just fine. And that's a very, very valuable time. So I encourage you guys to use it wisely. Um, and the second learning that I got from this was that when I think back to the time where I was sitting there at, at 15, um, running my podcast and reading emails, is that on the internet, nobody knows how old you are. right? Um, and so increasingly, I mean, at this point, some people have called me like a veteran in the mobile industry. Like, what does that even mean? Like, I'm 21, right? Um, but it turns out the industry has only been around for five years. So it can kind of make sense. Uh, and and it, the reality is that increasingly we're moving to a world where degrees don't mean that much, and we're measured by what we built. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity for you guys. Um, OK, so just uh, last Sunday, um, I graduated from Stanford, um, and uh, my four years there. <laughs> thank you. Come on. Uh, my my four years there have been quite the ride. Um, my freshman year, I started a company um, that focused on computer vision technology. We were building face tracking software um, for a variety of reasons, and it got acquired uh, a while a while back, um, actually for a completely different application than my current project. Um, but one of the things that we were working on uh, was a lightweight face tracker. And we ported it to Google Glass, to smart glasses, because why not? Uh, and so what can you do, we thought to ourselves, what can you do with a system that can track facial expressions and that can, that can track faces, really, uh, on a piece of smart glasses? Well, maybe you can help some people who struggle with that. And so an idea was born uh, that, that I had a personal connection to, which is that there's about one in 62 kids in the U.S. who have autism. And uh, one of the things they struggle the most with are faces, recognizing expressions in people's faces. They actually have to learn throughout their life. Um, and the prevailing approach to doing this in behavioral therapy right now is essentially like flashcards. It's rote memorization. But the problem is that the way I smile, the way some girl on the flashcards might smile, aren't the same. And it's hard to take that learning into the actual situation. And so what we propose to do is create a pair of wearable smart glasses that use machine learning to track faces around you, uh, analyze facial expressions in them, and give you feedback right then and there. Um, and so we did this essentially by developing a bunch of uh, expression recognition technology that uh, we made work across a variety of different lighting conditions and different faces. Um, and so to actually turn that system into a useful learning aid, uh, we've developed a whole bunch of games and a whole bunch of applications around it um, that make it fun to use. And so to just give you an idea of what that looks like and how we integrate it into behavioral therapy, uh, what you see here is what we call the parent review app. And basically what it allows you to do is take ownership of your own data and, uh, and review what happened in a given moment. So you can, you can jump back to that moment where dad got angry because we tracked it and talk through what worked, talk through what might have gone wrong, and, uh, and uh, figure out what to learn from that. Um, so We've evaluated this uh, in a 40-person in-lab study. And uh, kids loved using the devices, even for just a short period of time. Um, and we're now running a much larger 100-person at-home trial uh, that we're still recruiting for. So come talk to me if you know somebody who could be a good candidate. Uh, and we're just in the qualitative stages of that. We, but uh, I can't really help but read out um, sort of one last piece of uh, uh, one quote that we got from one of the families writing in just a, a couple days after the study started originally. Uh, and so what she writes is that we already noticed something very dramatic I'd like to share. 
my son is actually looking at us when he talks through the Google Glasses during a conversation, and it was noticed without the glasses from his teacher in language art yesterday. It's almost like a switch was turned. Thank you, my son is looking into my face. So, you know, pretty powerful. All right, um, and with that, uh, I, I, I can't help but feel like sort of one recurring theme that I haven't touched on in my story uh, is, is that of mentorship. Um, the reason I get to be here today is because of a lot of great people. Steve Capps, I briefly talked about. Terry Winograd, uh, my advisor at Stanford. They've been a tremendous part of my story. Um, and uh, and I, feel, I feel extremely fortunate for that. And you know, I sort of had to learn, as an engineer, we always try to solve problems on our own. Um, but uh, if you ask for help, people will help you with a lot more than, than you imagine. Um, okay, and so with that, I want to thank the, uh, the Lemison and MIT program and the UK CAFES team uh, for putting on the celebration of, of something that I was really looking for when I was in Germany. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I want to thank my team, uh, everybody at Stanford, Terry Winograd, Carl Feinstein, Dennis Wall, my co-founder Nick Haber, and all of you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>